Hi, my name is Daniel Blackburn and today I'm going to talk to you about soil phosphorus and how to manage this important nutrient for plant nutrition for crops. So this is the second video of the phosphorus lecture. The first video was about introduction and biogeochemical cycle. Now we're going to talk about the human impact on the phosphorus cycle, how to manage phosphorus fertility, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about phosphorus as a non-renewable natural resource. Okay, let me jump to the slide. Okay, so in, a, in this, uh, uh, this slide shows the phosphorus cycle uh, from rock phosphate reserves up until this phosphorus are lost from the environment, yeah? Lost from the environment into waters. And every arrow here accounts for a transformation of phosphorus or uh, a cycling in phosphorus across uh, the, 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 its life cycle, yeah? Through uh, fertilizer production, uh, how, how long it stays in soil and how is it cycling soil, how is it lost uh, from soils into waters and uh, through domestic animals and uh, back to agriculture or not. Uh, so the, the, main, uh, the main message from this life cycle analysis of phosphorus is that uh, phosphorus is a one-way cycle. Yeah? And when, when we consider the cycle in human terms, within life cycles of human beings, you only consider phosphorus being a, a limited natural resource of rock phosphates that are being mined and mobilized, used for agriculture and for industry, and slowly being lost for waters and for landfills. Yeah? And everything we can do in this, uh, in, in, in between, to recycle and reuse and make that this phosphate molecule stay longer within the, the use of uh, or use in agriculture or industry, uh, the better, yeah? Because if this rock phosphate at some point will end, like oil will end as a non-renewable natural resource, and rock phosphate will end up being on the bottom of the oceans. And we will have to find a way to mine uh, deep oceans for phosphate, which will be much more expensive uh, and, uh, than it is to just recycle the phosphorus in these environments. So what happens with phosphorus when we add it to the soil as fertilizer? And if you analyze any given system, uh, farm uh, systems for the phosphorus balance, if you add up all the inputs and if you add up all the outputs, you will find there is a missing phosphorus. You the, the inputs are much higher than the outputs. And that means that this phosphorus is staying in soils. Soils act as a reservoir of phosphorus. Almost uh, a, a big chunk of this, uh, the phosphorus applied as, of, as fertilizers stays in the soil and is uh, accumulated. Yeah, accumulated. This accumulated phosphorus is called legacy phosphorus. The phosphorus which are legacy from previous years of fertilizer application. And in which part of the soil this phosphorus stays? The majority of the phosphorus, if you, uh, uh, if you measure the buildup of phosphorus in the depth of the profile, it's usually observed that the first centimeters of the soil will accumulate almost all that phosphorus. They are staying as a legacy phosphorus. This is a big problem, as we spoke in the last lecture because the first centime centimeters of soil are the ones that are usually eroded and uh, end up contaminating the waters. So there's a, the phosphorus is very inconvenient in a sense that it's not very mobile in the soil environment. It stays on the surface in the topsoil and because of that it's easily lost also from the environment. Most of this phosphorus is phosphate, inorganic phosphorus, which is either adsorbed or precipitated. But depending on the environment, you have that up to half of this phosphorus, sometimes even more than half, 
can be accumulated as organic phosphorus, yeah? organic phosphorus. And within the organic phosphorus, most of it is on monoester uh, phosphate molecules. Diester phosphorus, like DNA and RNA, are actually uh, uh, um, a, man, uh, it's a, a minor part of the organic phosphorus pool. The majority is monoester phosphorus, and uh, inorganic phosphorus <coughs> that can be precipitated uh, uh, in, uh, in di with different counter ions or adsorbed uh, into the colloids of the soil. So when we study uh, these phosphorus pools from the point of view of the availability to plants as a, a bioavailability, as a fertility pool, we uh, play with extractions of the soil. Some extractants will be able to extract more phosphorus from the soil, other extractants less. And we evaluate which extractants are best correlated to the plant uptake of phosphorus. So it's uh, in many countries, especially in, in countries like Oman, with calcareous soils and uh, alkaline soils, uh, Olsen phosphorus is uh, usually used as a, as a standard for uh, evaluation of phosphorus fertility. Also, it means that the Olsen phosphorus represents roughly uh, uh, the fraction of soil that the plants could have access to. Yeah, that the plants could have access to. So it, it the Olsen phosphorus is accounting for two things. One is the, the soluble, water soluble phosphorus directly on soil solution or easily dissolve, uh, 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 soluble. And the other one is the readily available extractable phosphorus. And how does the Olsen account for this readily available phosphorus is by uh, uh, the, um, the sodium hydrogen carbonate will desorb some of the phosphorus from the solid phase. And that desorbed phosphorus will be now uh, accounted in this extract. But this is not all the phosphorus on the soil. You have other phosphorus with low accessibility and very low accessibility, which are slowly cycled. It can be bioavailable, but on the longer term. Yeah? In the long term, these other uh, pools can also be um, uh, accessed by plants. But keep in mind that when we talk about bioavailability, the type of pools that we are looking at, these are um, arbitrarily defined pools. They don't mean that they're directly uh, translated into a chemical form of phosphorus. You know, it does not mean that this immediately available is one chemical form of phosphorus and the other one is a different chemical form. It's just about talking roughly the range of energy that is needed to mobilize this phosphate molecules into the solution and from the solution to be uptaken by plants. So talking about extractant solutions, how does it work when we quantify phosphorus from solutions? It works in, a, in, a, in, in this way. We uh, weigh a certain amount of uh, soil. We add the, the extractant solution. In the case of ocean extract, is soil hydrogen carbonate um, and 0 0.5 molar at pH 8.5. And we shake the soils with this extractant for a given amount of time. We filter and the filtrate, then we can quantify phosphorus. If, if you look at the video about moly blue phosphorus, you will see the full explanation about how to quantify phosphorus in aqueous solutions. But the, uh, uh, Olsen is not the only way you can extract phosphorus or represent bioavailable phosphorus for crops. Uh, in some other countries, Bray extractant uh, and, 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 for example, in Brazil, Melich extractant will be the standard for bioavailability. In other countries also, resin phosphorus are used as a standard for phosphorus bioavailability. The, the moly blue method uh, works uh, by staining the phosphorus. It forms a Keegan structure. This Keegan structure is then reduced. And the, the reduced Keegan structure, the small crystal, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, be, uh, develops a blue color. So the more blue color you will have on the, on, the, on the extract, the more phosphorus you would have. And you use the spectrophotometry 
as a method for uh, quantifying the amount of phosphorus on the extract and as you know how much is on the extract you can back calculate how much phosphorus there is on the soil as the milligrams per kilogram or ppm of course this soil is the soil that is being extracted by this extractant you know it's not the total or the soluble one is the a bioavailable form as represented by each one of these extractants for a man we are always using the ocean phosphorus as a standard for fo uh, phosphorus bioavailability uh, it's also been shown that in literature that other technologies or methods such as dgt diffusive gradient in thin films it's a better representation of phosphorus bioavailability Nevertheless, sometimes it's easier and more practical to quantify phosphorus using uh, an extraction than it is by a uh, dynamic uh, passive sampler um, that will, will quantify not only the concentration of a given pool, but also include in this evaluation the sorption and desorption kinetic parameters from the soil. It becomes a little bit more complicated when we, we use these uh, passive samplers. Um, but uh, they are a better representation of plant bioavailability. Nonetheless, to make it simple, uh, the standard is ocean phosphorus as a measurement of bioavailability of phosphorus to plants. Even in soils which are not ideal for ocean extract, many countries do use ocean extract as a standard. For example, UK use, use ocean extractant, even though the soils from UK are not actually the best soils for uh, this type of extractant. So when we think about these bioavailable phosphors and the, the, these measurements of phosphorus bioavailability, when you get when you measure them, you get a value, yeah. And these values will represent uh, what is the status of your soil with regards to bioavailability. Is it high? Is it low? Or is it in a range which you consider optimum for plants? If you have low phosphors you need to effectively build up fertility, soil fertility. It means you need to add phosphorus fertilizer if you have low phosphorus. If you have an arrange which is optimum, you don't need to do anything, but you should try to optimize the phosphorus cycling to uh, maintain these optimum levels. You know? When you have soils with excess phosphorus, which is the majority of the cases in Oman, uh, these soils with excess phosphorus, now you need to think about nutrient pollution. If you have too much uh, phosphorus in the soil, these phosphorus are contaminating the waters. And then you need to, first of all, stop adding phosphorus to the soils and deplete the phosphorus to environmentally acceptable levels. We measure in Oman even over 200 ppm of ocean phosphorus, which is absurdly high and much more than the plants need for uh, survival. So the next thing you have to think about is this concept of the critical phosphorus. This critical P, uh, this concept is also transferable for other nutrients. Phosphorus, usually you will not see a toxicity of phosphorus for plants. If you have too much phosphorus, it would not negatively affect plants. You will just build up more and more phosphorus in the soil. Uh, but if you have too little, the yields of the plant will not uh, be the, the all you could get. You know, the maximum yields that you will get, you have to reach a certain critical level. When you reach a critical level between 95 and 98 percent, that satisfies the maximum uh, 95 to 98 percent of the maximum yields, then is when you say that this measurement of phosphorus availability corresponds to the optimum you know, what you should strive to have as a minimum um, of course these measurements can vary a little bit uh, when you have as, as uh, 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 the, the use will vary with with uh, for the same uh, measurement depending on other growth factors such other fertilizers but the range in which you will find this maximum yield will be similar even though the other factors are maintained. So you can actually uh, represent this together 
and you can say this limit here is where you need to reach to have a maximum use of your plants. For the case of oats and phosphorus, you, we, we are talking about uh, near 20 uh, ppms, milligrams per kilogram in soil. So yeah, near 20, 18, 20, it's enough for the plants to have maximum yield. Over that, the yields will not be increased. So when I speak that in Oman we find 100, 150, 200 ppms, we are way beyond. Yeah, we need, we we do not need to add more phosphorus in these conditions. Uh, in the cases where, where we are below 20, then we need to correct the phosphorus to this level. So these are the the ranges which we should that we keep in mind for phosphorus fertility below 12 ppm's low, yeah from 12 to 17 uh not too low marginal yeah marginal 18 to 25 excellent you have the the appropriate range of oils and phosphorus in your soil not dangerous not too dangerous for uh nutrient pollution and not low that the plants will suffer you have a good range where plants will have uh, adequate phosphorus nutrition above 25 the phosphorus is too high yeah the phosphorus is too high so you need to stop adding phosphorus fertilizer this is important because if the farmers if you know and you can recommend that the farmers they have too much phosphorus they need to stop adding npk they only need to add n and k not p yeah so if they have the phosphorus too high then you need to recommend the, the farmer to stop adding phosphorus this is really important really important so how do you calculate how much for let's say you are low yeah? let's say you are low in your soil how do you know how much phosphorus you need to add because not all the phosphorus that you add will be available to the plants yeah? some of it will be fixed on the soil and stored and be unavailable to plants so the the, the critical thing that you need to know to calculate here is the the uh, dose equivalent ratio yeah the dose equivalent ratio is how many kilograms of uh, uh, phosphorus you need to add per hectare to increase one ppm of oats and pea if you know this number in uh, uh, you 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 can calculate this so uh, normally our soils would be around five six to eight uh, kilograms uh, of uh, phosphorus per uh, hectare to increase 1 ppm of oats and pea in some phosphorus with high fixing capacity uh, this number can go uh, over 15 yeah over 15 16 18 kilograms per hectare to increase 1 ppm of oats and pea so let's say you have a target uh, phosphorus of 20 ppm and your current level of the phosphorus that you measure is 15 so what you need you need to add another five uh, you need to increase your soil uh, your soil phosphorus by five ppm you want to reach 20 but now you have 15. what do you do 20 minus 15 times six kilograms of phosphorus per hectare per ppm then you get 30 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare now you need to consider that your fertilizer does not contain only phosphorus is the, it's not a hundred percent phosphorus the tsp triple superphosphate will have 45 percent phosphorus so if you divide the 30 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare by uh, 45 percent of phosphorus on the triple superphosphate it will give you the amount of kilograms of triple superphosphate that you need to add per hectare yeah and of course next year you will need to measure again yeah you you had 15 you raised it to 20 but next year it would not be 20 the plants would have export some some of these phosphorus would be fixed so maybe <coughs> you have increased your phosphorus from 15 to 16 or 17 but you will still need to measure again and do a new recommendation of fertilizer based on the deficiency but every year you will have to add less phosphorus because most of the phosphorus is stored uh, as a legacy phosphorus in the soil then the majority of these phosphorus will slowly be released to plants when you build up phosphorus fertility you can spend several years without having to use a phosphate fertilizer then you can come back and every five years do 
just an adjustment of the phosphorus fertility. But this is, of course, when you have deficiency of phosphorus. Uh, most of the cases, you will have high phosphorus because of the history of fertilizer application. Normally, the farmers will, would have been applying this phosphate without knowing if they needed or if they didn't need. So what they're only doing is add more, add more. And normally the farmers are thinking, ah, I need to add phosphate because it helps the root system. Not false, but maybe you already have enough. Yeah? If you have enough on the soil, what, you, what you're adding is actually not changing the plant behavior at all. Yeah? So this is how you calculate. This is the most recommended way for you to calculate phosphorus fertilizer recommendation. Yeah? And if it's an organic fertilizer, you can do the same calculation. Uh, but you can uh, now, instead of dividing by the percentage in triple superphosphate, you can divide it by the percentage of phosphorus in the fertilizer. If the fertilizer has 1.5% phosphorus, and you have to divide here by 0 0.015, and then it will give you the amount of kilograms of this manure that you were applying. There is a second way to calculate phosphorus uh, uh, fertilizer application. Uh, but I, this is a way that I, don't not, I do not recommend. Yeah? This is a way that I do not recommend. Why? Because it does not consider how much is on the soil. If you consider how much phosphorus there is on your plant material, and you uh, transform this, uh, the amount of phosphorus that you are removing per hectare, so you have yield of your plant per, per area, you have a, uh, in a concentration of phosphorus, per unit of yield, let's say uh, tons of um, uh, tons per hectare of wheat, let's say you're removing from the field, and now you will have kilograms of phosphorus per ton of uh, uh, wheat that you are removing. Yeah? If you multiply these two, you, you will know how much phosphorus you are removing from the farm, from the farm per a given unit of area. Now, if you divide this by the efficiency of the fertilizer, it means that you can now know how much you have to add in uh, kilograms per hectare of, you know, so this is this here is a um, rough calculation that is showing this, this, this procedure. If you have 1,500 uh, 1, kilograms per hectare of yield, 14% moisture content, 0.3% uh, on the grains, efficiency of 10% and uh, the source of phosphate that you're using is triple superphosphate. So the question is how much triple superphosphate should you add to the field? Yeah, should be, how much should be applied? So the, the, the calculation in sequence is first, you calculate the dry weight, yeah, divide by 1.14, uh, considering you have 14% moisture. Uh, so you will get this uh, dry weight of that you are remo removing of plants per hectare. Now you have the concentration of phosphorus in uh, kilograms of phosphorus per kilograms of uh, grains. Then you can now uh, multiply this uh, dry weight of the plants by the concentration of phosphorus, and then you will get how many kilograms of phosphorus per hectare are you removing. Yeah? So now to transform these kilograms of phosphorus that is being removed per hectare into a uh, fertilizer recommendation, you, uh, uh, well, this is also dividing by the efficiency, by the way, uh, dividing by the efficiency. And now you, to transform these kilograms of phosphorus into a uh, fertilizer recommendation, you divide by the concentration of phosphorus on the fertilizer, yeah? And will give you how many kilograms of TSP you should add per hectare. So this is a recommendation based on the plant export. Yeah? The other recommendation that we see on the previous slide, this is basing, based on correcting the measurement of the soil analysis. This is a better method. Yeah? If you correct the ozone phosphorus, it's a better method than uh, adding the export. Because you might be exporting some amount of phosphorus, but you are exporting and you already have enough on the soil. Why are you going to need to add more phosphorus? So uh, actually, if you have enough, do not, use, you know, do not use more phosphorus fertilizer. 
Now, the other condition that you need to consider is, um, in general, uh, some, some crops will consider an empirical amount. They say, oh, for this crop, you add uh, 30 kilograms per hectare. And this is not a good way also of doing this. Many, many technical assistance for the, the farmers is being done by uh, salesmen, salesperson from a fertilizer company or a, a agrochemical company, and they are interested in selling. And they, are, they, they themselves do not know a lot about uh, the, the, the science behind uh, this nutrient availability to plants. So they just go and say, yeah, give you know, this amount of, of fertilizer. And the same, same is done for organic fertilizers. Yeah, the, the organic fertilizer, uh, 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 for example, compost or manures, uh, normally they're recommended as a fixed dose yeah? you, because they, they're multi-nutrient. They have nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and they are used as, a, as an amendment for physical properties also, not only for uh, plant nutrition. The organic fertilizers, they are used for enhancing the, the, the soil properties overall. So uh, it, normally it's a fixed amount, 10 tons per hectare, for example, of compost. But if you do it for replenishing the crop of take or the other ones, what you only need to do differently than the calculation that I told you before is when you divide now the, 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 the amount of phosphorus that you need to apply, you divide by the concentration of phosphorus in the organic fertilizer. And that will give you the, the number will give you kilograms of the compost that you need to apply or the organic fertilizer. If it's 1%, it's 0.5%, is it 1.5%, then you need to just use this number, divide in here, and it will give you the dose that you need to apply. So the calculations are the same. You just need to uh, use the percentage here in the last step of the calculation, and then you can recommend also organic fertilizer based on the phosphorus. But if you have enough phosphorus, then you do not need to add. So it's even sometimes uh, better to add N and K fertilizer than add NPK because maybe you have too much phosphorus, you know? And then you don't want to cause contamination of waters. What types of chemical fertilizers are used, you know? What type of chemical fertilizers are used? The main types are monoammonium mon uh, mono phosphate and diammonium phosphate. Uh, secondly is triple superphosphate. Triple superphosphate is the more concentrated one. When you have one ammonium phosphate and the ammonium phosphate, then you will uh, have to consider that this fertilizer is also adding nitrogen to the soil. Uh, why this is the main source in many countries, you, you, this is, it's very hard to find triple superphosphate, is because they are the, uh, the, the the nitrogen fertilizers, the, the, there's a lot of concern about uh, uh, being weaponized. Yeah, this, the, you can weaponize nitrogen fertilizers. So if you combine them with the phosphate, and then you avoid this problem. So this is the ammonium, ammonium phosphate and the ammonium phosphate becomes the, the main sources of fertilizer in many countries. All right. So the, the, the thing about now, if you have enough phosphorus in the soil, if you have a lot of phosphorus in the soil, how many, uh, how much phosphorus is reduced year by year if you stop adding the fertilizer? And this is one analysis done in UK, uh, made by Johnston et al, 2016. And this analysis shows and uh, builds up a curve in which uh, you will start with about 50 OSNP and if, how many years will you, uh, 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 you know, this phosphorus be depleted from the soils. So it actually uh, takes about 10 to 15 years to deplete from 50 to the, the conditions where you need to apply fertilizer again. Between 10 and 15 years, you will need to come back and apply fertilizer. In the case of Oman, if you have 200 or 150 or 100, actually it will take many more years. So what is telling this curve here is the rate of reduction of how, how much, how long does it take for phosphorus to be depleted from soils. This will be different in different soils, but it gives you an idea that the legacy phosphorus that you have in the soils uh, could be enough 
for sustaining crops for a long time still if you do not lose it for er by uh, in erosion you know if you do not lose it by uh, by erosion these phosphorus can uh, sustain crops for at least a decade depending on how much you have if you don't have enough then you have to add fertilizer uh, this is uh, uh, also uh, an analysis of the legacy phosphorus this is crossing when you have phosphorus application in kilograms per hectare in Europe uh, and here is phosphorus uptake by plants yeah you have that between 1965 you were increasing the phosphorus application the, the rate of phosphorus application was being increased in uh, in about here uh, the, the the end of, of the last century we re start reducing the the amount of phosphorus that was being applied as fertilizer and even though we were re reducing the amount of phosphorus being applied the, the plant uptake was still increasing yeah the plant uptake was still increasing which means that this the use of this phosphorus here is due due to the legacy phosphorus the phosphorus that was in the soil stored and now being used by the plants after you reduce the amount of fertilizer that you're apl applying so legacy phosphorus need to be considered in this equation many times and 80 percent of the farms in oman will not need to apply phosphorus as a fertilizer you just need to know that you have enough and then you stop applying the rest of the case the rest of the 20 percent that needs fertilizer application then you need to calculate it responsibly you don't need to add more than you need just the amount that you need to correct for the your target amount of OSMP. next question is what you do in your organic farming yeah what you do in organic farming what are the strategies what are different strategies for increasing phosphorus fertility uh, when you uh, besides besides uh, adding phosphorus fertilizer so one obvious uh, strategy in one which is very popular now is green manure and cover crops yeah green manure and cover crops are crops that you grow in the off season uh, let's say in Oman in summer you cannot grow your tomatoes yeah but you have your field bare but you can grow something else some plants which, which will be more resistant to the summer and will be able to cover the soil uh, prevent some wind erosion and add fertility to your soils these crops you can have these crops uh, being some crops that are able to mobilize the phosphorus and increase the phosphorus fertility on the soil the root exudate from these plants will help to build fertility on the soil and then you can then uh, incorporate this as organic matter to the soil or leave it on the surface as a, 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 a mulch yeah? a cover crop mulch if you use cover crops or green manures uh, this will for sure increase the phosphorus fertility and it's a good strategy when you're doing organic farming sometimes you have a soil which you have a huge legacy phosphorus uh, and then you can just manage by increasing the cycling uh, for a long time for a long time and when you eventually need more fertility uh, then you can add some uh, organic fertilizers on this system I want to finish this lecture by talking about phosphorus as um, as a non-renewable natural resource we need to be very responsible in how we use phosphorus because we the phosphorus comes from mines like you see here on the bottom you are mining phosphate rock producing these fertilizers and uh, these fertilizers the this rock phosphate the, we have a limited amount of them it's not really certain now this debatable amount of uh, how long this will take to completely uh, use up all the phosphorus we have right now the estimates are over 300 years uh, uh, mm -hmm. but still 300 years is not much if you think in, in generation time a few generations more you will have that you have the your your grand grandsons perhaps they will live in a world where you do not have enough phosphorus to produce the crops and the food for the planet for the humans in the planet so what we need to take care of is that we use this responsibly and make this last the more we can and recycle the phosphorus in the system the more we can avoid losing it in contaminating waters yeah 
So we had a very big scare in about 2008, which uh, uh, um, a paper came out by, by Dana Cornell that uh, was speculating that we are, we are near uh, a peak phosphorus, which the, 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 we could not produce enough fertilizer already in a, in, a, in a short term. And this was a big scare because fertilizer prices were going up very strongly and uh, uh, phosphate production was not uh, uh, being enough to supply the market. Um, so, but uh, shortly ever after that, we realized that we, we were still not on peak phosphorus, but, um, or even near peak phosphorus, but it, it, it prompted us to think about how soon it will be before we reach this point. And it, uh, it's important that now we start worrying about these things at the moment and ration, uh, rationing the amount of phosphorus we use as fertilizer. The other big issue about the fertilizer production is how is it distributed in the world? Yeah, many countries like uh, 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 USA has only 2% of the, the world phosphorus. Europe has nothing. Europe has no phosphate rock. Yeah? Many countries, that th they do not have phosphorus uh, as a mineral res resource. And most of the phosphorus of the world is concentrated in the West Sahara and Morocco. This is a highly problematic region, you know, a problematic region, unstable region. Uh, and the more the phosphorus becomes depleted on the world, the more the attention will be drawn to this area and people will want to control this area geopolitically to be able to produce food for, their, for the food security of their own countries. So it's already announced that in f for future years, uh, th uh, there's gonna be trouble, like we have trouble today for oil, that uh, there's all these wars that are based on just uh, controlling the production of oil on the world. In the future, this will be about rock phosphate, and this will be a big, a, a big issue. So the geopolitical issues uh, surrounding the uneven distribution of this natural resource in the world uh, will be something to uh, to be a, a big issue for future generations. Yeah, for future generations. But because we know this today, we need to act responsibly and avoid this from happening. So a key concepts for you to remember is about uh, the fertilizer application. Uh, when do you need it? When you do not need it? How do you measure phosphorus availability to plants? Uh, the concept of legacy phosphorus, uh, the, the agronomic tests for measuring availability, uh, the, the different pools of phosphorus in the soil, different types, chemical types on, in bioavailability pools, and the social and geopolitical issues regarding but uh, fertilizer, phosphorus production, and use. Yeah. So this is all I have to bring for you today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for joining, and see you next next lecture.